Hello, um, I'm quite often asked about the writing process and how long it takes and how much I know before I start and all these kind of questions and so I thought it might be a good idea to um, do a video of the process of writing the next uh, full-length Morton book. So this is kind of day one um, which is the 30th of November 2018 and um, I say it's kind of the beginning because the way I tend to work is that on my phone and in a Word document that I keep um, I quite often add ideas as they come along. So the idea for this book that I'm about to start I had probably a year ago, I can't remember now the exact catalyst but it was something along the lines of thinking that a spy book would be a good idea um, and that Morton has to find out about somebody who is a spy. Um, so I've got, I do have ideas, I haven't started writing a single thing. In my notes files um, they're just literally sentences, a couple of paragraphs, a link to a story, um, an idea for a character name perhaps. Um, but nothing concrete, I haven't actually written anything yet. So I'm thinking it's going to be called The Something Affair, I don't know what The Something is yet, probably the main character's surname, but that may change. Um, and all the ideas I have at this stage do change a lot, so hopefully you'll get to see how much they change and why they change. So at this stage it's looking to be a spy book. I'm thinking I will tell it backwards, just to be confusing for me. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think it will start at the end of this character's life. So I'm thinking that this spy is old and he's lived his life, he's done his spying duty and service and probably in the prologue somebody who doesn't like what he's doing, which is compiling his life story, um, basically gets pushes him off a balcony or he jumps off a balcony because he's about to be pushed off a balcony. So I'm thinking as a subplot to um, this book that possibly um, <coughs> Juliet might be pregnant or she might have just had a baby. It's probably going to be the modern part, it's probably going to be set in September, October 2019 so I would need to think about how that's all going to happen. Um, and I'm also thinking that Morton notices on Ancestry he has a match that's quite close that he can't place on either side of his family tree and he discovers possibly this is that his grandfather um, had a thing with a prostitute possibly um, which is kind of inferred in the wicked trade so the last full length uh, book Morton's dad Jack implied that Margaret's dad wasn't around very often and he would disappear off and I was kind of setting that up at that point to be something, some mystery that I would then pick up on in this next book. Um, so I'm thinking it's that and I'm thinking also it could link to the, possibly the start of another series um, but which I don't know too much about and I'm not going to tell you about yet. Um, anyway, so there's that possibility that he, Morton is also, as part of the subplot, is trying to work out who this woman he's matched to on Ancestry could be, how she fits into his family tree and um, what's going on there. I've looked at a couple of um, spy records that the National Archives holds. They don't seem to have many um, MI6 records, which is the foreign spy agency, but they do have quite a lot of MI, MI5, which is the um, national security 
for Britain. So I'm going to go up to National Archives next week and actually look at some of these documents and see. I don't know if there will be, there will obviously be Morton who is the main character in the modern day. I don't know if there will be another modern day person taking the lead narrative but in the past there will certainly be the spy and possibly I'm thinking a lady. Um, I'm thinking maybe she's an actress or something um, that around the key time, 1950s, 1960s, 70s, she um, plays a, a pivotal role. Um, and that's kind of it, that's kind of where I'm at. So uh, that, that for me is the starting point of, the, the proper starting point, I suppose. So yeah, that's kind of where I'm at thinking about the starting of this next book. Um, I haven't actually written a single word other than the notes. Um, and so now I'm already started making notes for the next book after that. That's kind of how I work. Um, so we'll see how that changes over the next few weeks. I hope it's kind of, it's Christmas stuff starting soon so there'll be lots of family things and Christmassy things to do so probably I'll actually start properly writing in January I would have thought so for now it's going to be continuing with research go to the archives working out who the characters are where they're living uh, what's going on a brief outline of the story and then um, I'll get going on it so enjoy the process because I have no idea what's going to happen. Bye. So I've come to London for a couple of days uh, of research. Yesterday I went to the London Metropolitan Archives and looked up some quite interesting records including um, Greenwich and Uxbridge Magistrates Court. Um, I'm hoping some of the records there I can use in the next book. Um, I took photographs of various court um, cases that came uh, to the Magistrates Court uh, and among the records I looked at yesterday at uh, LMA were things like um, drunk and disorderly, car thefts with car registration numbers and addresses and ages of people so I'm hoping I'll get a few of those records into the next book, don't know how yet that's to be decided. Um, and today I am at the National Archives, dun, 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 which is exciting. And I've got a big list of uh, documents I've pre-ordered and I shall be sitting in uh, Morton seat, 10B, and um, seeing what I can see. Most of the records I've got on order are um, to do with MI5 and their cabinet papers and things and so quite exciting. Lots of them were closed until fairly recently um, so it should be quite an exciting day. I'll try and film maybe in there if I can if I don't look too stupid uh, or not too noisy and um, I'll let you know how I get on. So we shall see. Hi, so it's the 17th of January. Um, I haven't done too much since um, I last updated, which was at the beginning of December. And I went to the Metropolitan Archives in London and the National Archives and did um, some research there. I took hundreds of photographs um, of various documents. And what I tend to do is not do too much in-depth work when I'm there just to use my time to photograph things that I think are relevant and I look at them later. So on my list today, now that the asylum promotion is kind of done and Christmas is out the way, uh, on my list of jobs to do first of all is to go through all the documents that I photographed at the LMA and the National Archives and start to try to pull out some ideas for storylines, um, plot lines, characters, etc. Um, and I've also got a huge stack of books beside me to read and uh, 
to look through to get some ideas hopefully. Um, so probably what I'll next do is update the video once I've done all that and I should I think hopefully have some idea then of where the storyline is going because at the moment it's still a bit vague and uh, so I need to get on with that so hopefully the next time I speak to myself like this I will have some ideas about where the storyline is going so that's it for the moment yesterday I finished finally going through the 664 uh, photographs that I took at the London Metropolitan Archives and the National Archives uh, last month and I've got a lot from that about the storyline and various other things for example I've also got um, some names so that I might use in the book uh, Montague Smallbones which I quite like Catch Pole has a surname Morris Oldfield somebody Nightingale Gabriel Briggs Harold Austin Violet Ramsey Hubert John Spencer Maud Skeggs, I like that one too. Uh, Ellen Theresa French, they're all pe real people's names that I've come across and I thought, they sound good. Um, but as I think I said before, I would like to probably call this book The Something Affair and The Something in the Middle would be uh, one of the main characters' names. I'm not sure The Small Bones Affair, The Catchpole Affair, maybe, I need to think on that. Not sure if they work. Um, I've also pulled out of um, the records I looked at uh, the magistrates' court records, and I looked at 1974, uh, 1968, and 1954 as well to kind of get an idea of what kind of cases were going before the magistrates, um, and to give you an idea. Um, at Heathrow Airport, this person was knowingly concerned in the attempted exportation of goods, namely uh, 28,000 Dutch guilders and 3,600 French francs with intent to evade. Um, within the Middlesex Commission did dishonestly receive a quantity of assorted tools or knowingly believe it to be someone be stolen by somebody. Um, obtained a Jaguar motor car registration MYK 372E belonging to Avis rent a car, um, steal a car radio, drunk in a public place, uh, stole a Barclay card number 92971364422, drive a motor car ex at speed exceeding 30 miles an hour. Um, I quite like this one. Uh, Heathrow Airport London acted as a pilot in command of an aircraft bearing the registration letter G. AWJA in controlled airspace in accordance with the instrument flight rules basically didn't report it <clears throat> so just flying around uh, Heathrow as you do um, I quite like the ones that give me some detail of the period in question as well so someone who broke into a building um, as a trespasser and then did steal therein a Philips 23 inch colour television a Philips stereo record player two Philips stereo speakers a Dunhill gold lighter a marker Parker felt pen, two Yale keys, twenty-seven pounds of cash, uh, and so the list goes on. <coughs> um, persistent cruelty to a wife, which also names the uh, the, the parties involved and any children they have. Um, uh, drunk and dis drunk and disorder in a public place, um, letting people come into the United Kingdom that shouldn't. Um, drive a motor vehicle with too much alcohol in the blood. Um, anyway, there's a whole selection of things there I, that I'm going to have to sift through and think. I would like to use Magistrate's Court records in this one um, because it's obviously got the spying element. Uh, so what else did I find? Oh, one of the interesting things at the National Archives uh, was this document, which I shall try and find. It's somewhere around here. Um, which basically said that uh, C, who is the person in charge of uh, MI6, in 1958, he had um, an unofficial reserve account with £1,563,000 in it, uh, and which he could use at his discretion. And unofficial means basically that it wasn't given 
to MI6 from the government. It was um, from well-wishers of the service, including an anonymous American donor. So I think there's quite a big scope there for potential storylines. Um, also, there's a big list of uh, secret operations going on uh, around the world at the time um, in the 50s and 60s that if, if I look them up, Google them, I think there's nothing to be found on them. So that's good for me because I can make up what those things are about and uh, link it to real documents and real stories, but with this fiction element. Places, I was kind of, I'm kind of wanting in this book to not, for Morton to not have to visit the Keep, which is the East Sussex um, record office, because he has done lots of times. Uh, and same goes for Maidstone, the Kent uh, repository. So I was looking for somewhere not too far away because I'm lazy and don't want to travel too far. Um, so I was thinking West Sussex for this one. Um, so that the local office, record office, where Morton would have to go would be um, West Sussex record office. And um, I was looking for somewhere to set the um, story where there's a lake because I'm thinking that in the 1940s section, um, there'll be a lake that's frozen and the boy drowns um, while his friend goes off to do something. So I'm looking for some of the lake in West Sussex, um, but that's not too huge. And that is a small village area with a church and somewhere therefore with a churchyard. And I think I found it in Ardingly, um, which is uh, yeah in the centre of West Sussex. And, um, uh, I think I've found uh, an ideal place to to have that. Um, there's a particular lake I've identified called Westwood Lake. Um, Matt, I may not end up using this, I need to visit it. That's the next thing um, that I'll have to do is to actually visit this lake and visit uh, Arding Line and see if it's an appropriate place to set the book. Right, so I finished reading my enormous stack of uh, research books and I've done even more on the internet and um, I've moved forwards with quite a lot of it. Um, so I've probably got my title. Um, I had several suggestions, so maybe the Solomon Affair, the Pullinger Affair, the Warrington Affair, the English Affair, which was my favourite for a while, the English Affair. Um, and then when I was doing my family tree the other day, uh, a lady in my tree, Minnie Dengate, uh, her and her husband, Christian Green, um, they had a child called Sterling. His Sterling was his first name, and I thought that's quite a good um, a surname for a character in the book. Uh, somebody Sterling, so it would be the Sterling affair. Um, I quite like the fact that a bit, a, a bit of ambiguity there as to what that might refer to, the Sterling part. Um, so that's my current favourite title. It isn't necessarily going to be what stays, but. That's what I'm working on. I've got some more character names as well. I think I've got Harold Austin, who's going to be a Tory MP. Um, Ellen Theresa French will be a former special branch officer and store detective once at Marks and Spencers, um, and who becomes an MI5 watcher, so somebody who um, follows people. Um, that they think potentially are spies or um, need to follow him for some reason. Um, and I think I said before, I'm going to have Hubert John Spencer, he's going to be my main character, even though he changes names, which I think could be quite confusing for the reader, but we'll see how that goes. And uh, Maurice Oldfield. So that's uh, some of the character names. I'm fairly sure now it will be kind of three parts and it will be a, the first part which is actually going to be at the end uh, that'll be set in the in the 40s um, then there'll be a part in the late 50s and a part which will be at the beginning uh, in the 70s I'm hoping I can navigate that because it could be confusing 
for the reader, but I hope I can navigate that because I can't see how I could do this book in a normal chronological order, which I usually do. All my books, they go in chronological order. There's the odd chapter that might be a flashback, but usually they're in order, but this can't be. The main character is Hubert John Spencer, born 1927, working class, lives in a basic cottage in Ardingly, which I'll need to find. I've booked uh, a trip after Roots Tech to go to West Sussex, to go to West Sussex Record Office, to go to Ardingly, to try and look at this lake and see if it's appropriate for the story, uh, and also going to uh, Cliveden House in Buckinghamshire. So that's all booked up, so I'll probably will do uh, a video from there to show the locations and everything. Um, so, Hubert John Spencer, I think, is the main character. Um, he's got a posh friend, Morris Oldfield, and they meet up at this lake. That's kind of their, how they get to meet and interact because they're not from the same worlds. Similar age. Um, they fish at the lake and they talk. Uh, I think that Morris probably has communist views at that point and talks to Hubert about them. Um, Hubert is into amateur radio and is very good at the technical side of uh, building radio sets, etc. And um, he takes Morris back to his house and they do amateur radio together. And one of Hubert's uh, contacts, if you like, through amateur radio is somebody who lives in Egypt. And they talk and they talk about it, um, which is an important part of the plot later. So I've got 44 pages of notes so far from everything that I've pulled together in one Word document. Uh, so the, this lake, Westwood Lake, it gets frozen and they're playing on it. Morris falls in um, just as Hugh's leaving. Hubert can't rescue him because he can't swim and Morris drowns and dies, um, if that wasn't clear. Uh, da, da, da. And then probably will be the very end of the book uh, is that Hubert goes home in 1944, back to his house, his little working class cottage, to find that a doodlebug has hit the house and his parents are killed, which is actually the moment when he decides he kind of needs to, he could change his life, become someone different because a lot of his past is gone. Um, so duh, 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 he joins up, uh, joins the army at uh, very, very end of the war. So there's no, you don't see any service particularly, but he gets sent to Egypt, um, which my grandmother's brother did. So I'm, I, and I did interview him before he died about his war experiences. So I might pull on, draw on some of that. So he's in Egypt and he goes to see this friend who he's met, I keep wanting to say online, but clearly it isn't online, uh, met through the airwaves, um, his Egyptian friend, and um, goes to go and see him because he's in the area. And he gets told that the this man has died, this boy man died. Um, and then it will miraculously somehow skip to the second part, which is the, where the main action of the story takes place, late 50s, early 60s. Um, and Hubert has taken on the identity of his Egyptian friend, um, who I didn't say this before, but the Egyptian friend is actually British, so his father is in Egypt on some uh, empire business or other. Um, so he's British, I didn't say that, make that clear. So he's British living in Egypt. So he takes, so Hubert takes on this British man's identity. It probably isn't very clear. It is in my mind, sort of. Um, and he starts to work as a journalist, but with this identity of the Egyptian. Um, living in London, he's going to all these kind of parties that brings him into contact with some of the people at the centre of the um, perfumer affair. So MPs, models, um, 
the high-flying people in society at the time uh, and also somebody in MI5 and he gets pulled into that kind of spying world um, and he gets chosen because he starts to do this into this area of uh, life um, because of his um, past in Egypt which clearly he hasn't had but his identity has this is really confusing isn't it um, he is chosen to uh, assassinate um, try to assassinate the president of Egypt um, General Nasser and uh, I found that lots of the unofficial funds that I was I mentioned in the previous video actually when I'm reading on the reading the books that I have on spying there are actually a lot of them uh, the money was concentrated on trying to unseat first of all unseat General Nasser in Egypt around the late 50s in fact from the mid 50s onwards um, to the point where Anthony Eden actually uh, the British Prime Minister said kill him actually take him out murder him get rid of him because he was seen as having nationalistic views that weren't pro-British and at the time Britain had uh, ownership or overseeing at least the Suez Canal which would allow a most direct route trade route through and Britain didn't want to lose that at the time um, so Anthony Eden basically said get rid of him kill him and so I'm thinking that this character is involved somehow clearly he, he actually wasn't assassinated so this fails somehow um, and then we move through the 50s and early very early 60s as I said, I'll probably put him at the Cliveden House uh, John Profumo party thing. Um, details still to be worked on. And then the last section in the 1970s, which as I said, well, you will see, you'll read first, um, is with the main character living under the identity of Morris Oldfield, so his friend from the war. He lived with or lived near in Arding Line. Um, and he's living quite a quiet life, but he's trying to find um, I think somebody, and I'm not sure if this is gonna be his wife or a friend or somebody, who um, it's claimed committed suicide, but it's actually murder. He's trying to find out exactly what happened and why. Something to do with the party scene and spying and this NASA assassination attempt. Um He's trying to work on that, and he's writing his life story to be re to reveal it all. Which is why, at the very beginning of the book, you have the prologue, um, where um, he basically is forced to jump off a balcony um, once he's revealed where his memory stick is containing his life story. Um, and I found I found an article in the uh, Hastings Observer about that would be really appropriate for this, which is that um, somebody fell off a balcony, jumped off a balcony, and it was under suspicious circumstances. But um, it, w it was found to be that he just had fallen. So I'm going to use some of the details from that as well. Um, dun, dun, dun. I've, I've got a lot of notes. As I said, I've got 44 pages of notes. Um, and I need to reread it all and put it all together and really tighten this plot before I start writing it. Um, so that's the next stage. But today I am going skiing. So I'm not going to do more for a moment. Uh, and then it's Roots Tech in Salt Lake City. I'm going to get back from that. I will actually begin writing this book at last, but hopefully, um, all the while I'm away, I'll be thinking of the plot and I'll be making notes on my phone um, and writing things down, jotting things down. So probably when I next make a video, I hopefully might sound a little bit more coherent. It might make sense, to me at least. Um, and then, uh, yes, as I say, I've got the trip to Ardingly and Cliveden and West Sussex Record Office and they will help me to 
visualize the places it's going to be and get some ideas for the records I can use and then um, yes yeah, so I'll, I'll then crack on with the writing but usually what happens is once I start the writing process I then just get going because I've spent so long on the research part that's my justification for taking so long anyway so that's it for this update So I think it's about a month since I last uh, did a video update. In that time, uh, I've been skiing and uh, I got back yesterday from Roots Tech, had an amazing time in uh, Salt Lake City with uh, lots of fellow genealogists. Um, sold lots of books, which was good. Um, but basically the last, that last month um, has been taken up with other things and all the things around uh, writing and, and research. I haven't done an awful lot, um, but I did print out my notes, which is 44 pages worth, and I took them with me uh, skiing and to Roots Tech, and um, as you can see, I've been scribbling all over them um, to kind of get the information, all my notes, all my research into my head firmly, and to kind of allow the story to develop. and. I had one last plot point that I needed to resolve, which I've done this morning. How I've done that, I don't know, because I, like I said, I flew in last night and the jet lag has yet to kick in, but I've allowed, it's allowed me to um, figure this last plot point out, which is really good. So I now have what I consider the bare bones of the story and, and enough for me to feel comfortable about starting to write it, which is really good. So tomorrow, begins the story. I have the uh, the word prologue written on my computer screen and that's as much as I have at the moment. I've got notes for the prologue which basically is that an old man is forced to jump off a balcony um, and he has to hand over a document first of all and basically that's the main character who has to hand over this document which is his life story and um, that's going to be an introduction to it. We're not going to know, the reader isn't going to know at that point what's on the document or who he is or why he's been forced to jump off a balcony. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's all it's all coming on quite nicely. I think I said last time it's going to be called, probably still, called The Sterling Affair. And that's named after Flora Sterling, one of the main characters. She's uh, somebody who's working for the Russians as a... Um, She's not really a spy herself, but she's paid basically to get information from uh, British agents. So that's what it's probably going to be called. Um, I can't think what else I need to say. So tomorrow, yes, writing will begin, which is very exciting. Very pleased about that. Um, I'm sure there'll be other um, changes be made, and I think it's next week. I'm going to go to West Sussex Record Office and Arding Lye and Cliveden House to do some research there to develop it, but I feel comfortable that I can start to write it at least. And straight after the prologue, it's a Morton chapter, and I'm very familiar with what I need to do there, and I, I know where that's got to go. Um, and that's going to start with him having a DNA match on Ancestry of 902 centimorgans which means that he's got a new half aunt that he doesn't know about or is it great half aunt I can't remember half aunt um, and so there's a that's the subplot to this storyline so I will um, end there and I'll probably come back probably when I'm at Clive Dunn and uh, Arding Lyon West Sussex Record Office unless I make any major progress with the writing itself and then I will keep you updated so that is all for today. Goodbye. So I have just written the prologue to the book. I'm quite happy with it. It's quite short, as you can see, it's only a page, which is usually um, what about what I do, roughly. I'm happy of that, which basically is uh, the main character, Morris Oldfield, um, jumping off a balcony. Um, so I've just, if I scroll up there, I have chapter one, 19th of October, 2019, right? Sussex, Morton Ferry was perplexed. 
I'm not sure if I've used that adjective before, perplexed, so I need to now look at my other books and see if I can find, if I've used it, that's the kind of feel I'm going for. So it's the 25th of April and I thought it probably was time to uh, update this video as to where I'm at. Um, it's been over a month now. I'm up to, word count wise, I'm up to 19,475 to be precise. And uh, that's chapter five. I'm up to, just started it. Um, I've had lots of delays with various other things taking over like writing talks for the genealogy show and um, holidays and other such lovely things um, so I haven't made as much progress as I probably could have done or would have liked to have done but I'm really pleased with it so far I had uh, I, as I think I've said I write I tend to write it in um, the order that you will read it from the beginning to the end I don't really like stopping and uh, leaving a gap and then going back to it but I've had to on one I did have to on one section which was that the main character uh, Morris Oldfield uh, basically he flew into uh, Heathrow Airport from France and landed a small Cessna 150 aeroplane there at night and um, I didn't have a faintest idea how uh, to write that because I've never flown a plane and I've never landed at Heathrow uh, in a plane that I've been flying and um, I just had no, no clue. So basically um, I contacted a few people and asked for their help and I got some really good advice from uh, one person who'd worked in air traffic control in the 1970s which is when the story takes place and um, he uh, Heathrow that was and he gave me some really good advice and said yes it would have been possible to land without being detected um, and basically told me all the procedures and who would be on duty and what they'd be doing uh, and the other uh, really good advice I got was from a uh, Cessna 150 pilot and he basically told me what you would need to do to land to land the plane uh, which buttons would be pressed and the speed you'd be going and uh, etc so pulling those two together yesterday, I was able to write the opening to chapter three and, um, and I'm really pleased with it. And I've sent uh, the pilot that snippet, that extract, just over a page so that he can review it and uh, make sure the technical aspects are correct. And so then that's now waiting with him and uh, I'm continuing with the story. So it's all going very well. I'm really pleased. It's all uh, it's all coming together, um, and yeah, no major problems so far. Uh, this chapter is Morton is just at West Sussex Record Office, which is where I was about a month ago, doing the research. So he's basically going through exactly the things and steps that I went through uh, whilst over there. Well, it's been three months since my last video update, so I'm a bit uh, behind on that, sorry. Uh, so I just want to bring you up to speed as to where I'm at. I've just today crossed over the 60,000 word mark, which is very good. And I tend to find that after 50, it gets faster and faster towards the end. So um, I'm very pleased with how it's going. Uh, my fears about how I would work this three-part book working in reverse uh, hasn't uh, proven to be a, a problem so far um, 
and I hope the reader doesn't find it too confusing. But it's all going very well, I'm very pleased, very happy with it all. I've had to make a few changes to character names. I realised I had um, Morris Duggan and Alexander Duffy and I thought the names were a bit too similar to have changed, changed them slightly. Um, I have also today I have uh, spoken to my uh, cover designer Patrick Dengate who does has done most of the book covers and um, I've sent him some ideas which I will show you in a moment that I would like to use and uh, I think uh, should be a very nice cover so that's good so it's all moving on in the in the right direction with another probably probably 40,000 words I think to go roughly be it will come in at around 100,000 possibly a bit more so um, yeah, it's all going very well. So I'll just show you those the photos uh, that I've chosen for the for the cover, which might change, but as it stands, they're the ones I would like to use. So we shall see. I'll show you the progress of the cover and everything else as we get on. So that's uh, the update for now. So this is my writing board that I created a few years ago at iStockPhoto.com. And it's basically where I get lots of the images. So you'll see some familiar ones here um, that I've used on uh, my book covers. So this is one of the ones at the back of Missing Man. This is the front of the Missing Man with uh, this bird superimposed onto it. Some of these cliff tops are used in, in uh, Spyglass. Um, there's the Orange Lilies book cover there. That's the Lost Ancestor book cover. And that's Hide in the Past book cover that I've used. That's the Asylum here on the left. Um, various other ones that haven't been used and some of them are just ideas. So this is the, this here, uh, these are the photos which are the ideas for the current uh, Sterling Affair book cover. And what I'm thinking at the moment is perhaps either this one or this one, which is I think my favourite one, to be uh, the main cover image. So I, I quite like it, I think it's quite evocative. I think it can very easily be uh, shown to be the 1950s or 1970s when the book is set. It's clearly London. Uh, and I would like uh, Patrick Dengate, if he can uh, do so, uh, to put some of these gentlemen onto that picture. Um, possibly with snow, possibly without the snow. I don't mind either, I think it looks quite good. So that's currently uh, my ideas as to where we're going with the cover. So I will uh, keep you updated as to how that progresses. Hello. So I thought I'd give you an update. It's not been very long since I last did an update and actually the word count hasn't climbed dramatically. Um, it's about 72,000 words. But I thought I'd update you where I'm at because I've hit this point where I do, I tend to with all my books around the 70 to 80,000 word mark, which is where I uh, need to think about the ending and how that's going to happen. Even though I've probably got about another 20 to 30,000 more words, I need to think about the, uh, the ending and how that's gonna be revealed, the twists and turns at the end particularly. Is it gonna be Morton that reveals it to the reader or one of the characters in the past? So is it gonna be Alexander or Flora or Ellen? who reveal that and so I need to kind of stop and just just think and just plot so at the moment what I'm doing is I'm writing down quite a detailed um, narrative of what happened in the Suez crisis day by day what went on and then I'm gonna take out of that the key parts that I would like to write about and then start to think about what's going to happen in the in the story and then when I come back to Morton what he's going to find out. I'm feeling like at the moment Morton is rushing ahead slightly than faster than I would like really. I've got a lot more to say in the past so that it's not it's not really a problem I just need to sit down and think how many more chapters I've got left of the book and how many more of those are going to be Morton, how many are going to be in the past narrative and uh, how the ending is going to be revealed. So that's what I will be doing uh, later today. Well, since I finished this, really. Um, I've also had uh, my cover designer, 
Pat Dengate has sent me uh, the cover. There's three different versions because of the type of picture I want. It's quite hard to read the wording, uh, the title information on two of them. And I, I really like the third one, which I will show you in a moment. So basically he's, he's now done and is just waiting uh, for me to send him the blurb which can be added to the, the back of the page and then it, he'll send it back to me, finished, and I can upload it to Amazon. Um, and I really, really like it. It's, uh, he always does a very good job of um, putting down uh, uh, this cover, which is uh, much better than I envisaged, despite my usually very vague instructions to him. Um, but I really like it. I really like it. It sets the it says everything about the book and sets the tone of the book and uh, I like it. So hopefully uh, you all will too. So you can see in this top uh, version here, the um, it's quite, with the white background, it's quite hard to read some of the title information. So I, I completely love all of this that he's done with uh, bringing those two images that I showed before together. So you've got uh, clearly an image of London and these Kind of dodgy looking spy men. This one he's kind of put uh, some colour behind the words to make them stand out. You can, can see the difference there. Um, but still I think it's a little bit too difficult to read. And then there's this version which is the one I'm going to go with uh, down here uh, where he's kind of put uh, um, a colour block behind and it really then makes the rest of the the, the title information stand out um, and I really like that so he was just giving me some options because I always ask for the the book covers to kind of fit in with the rest of the series so far and um, he was just concerned that all the wording in this all the text would be in white whereas in previous books then it isn't all white but I'm, I'm really happy with it I really like it so last week in the last video I said that I'd reached that point which uh, I seem to reach in all books where I need to think about how the ending is going to be played out and I then spent uh, a good few hours uh, trying to work that out and um, I'll show you the the, the structure that I, that I came up with. It's a very very broad slightly vague um, outline of the last chapters so it's quite an exciting time to be at, to, to be thinking about how the book's going to be wrapped up. Um, I'll show you what that looks like and uh, I don't tend to stick to it religiously and, and allow the characters and storyline to take on uh, its own its own life, um, but it gives me some kind of a, a guidance as to where I would like the story to go in order to wrap up all the various storyline threads by the end in a satisfactory manner. So um, I'll show you uh, what that looks like. So this is the next chapter that I've got to do <clears throat> to write is this one. I've kind of written the paragraph of it so far and that's all. Um, and then going on to the next one and thinking about Morton's next paragraph and what he's going to find out. Making sure he doesn't find out too much before the it's revealed to the reader in the past. Um, you can see some of it's quite uh, vague at this point, so I'm expecting it to pick up in detail from uh, what I've written already beforehand. And then um, I've written, <laughs> I now need a snowy, wintry London scene, which is crucial to the storyline uh, because of the book cover. Um, I really liked the cover, I really like the snow, and it's not going to be too difficult to, to fit a a part in that's in a snowy wintry London scene so um, look out for that that'll be a crucial one but I don't know what it is yet. Um, Hello so it's been a while since I've done an update and uh, very exciting news I have finished the book I finished the last chapter yesterday um, and so today I've been doing some what I call yellow edits so basically when I'm writing anything that I think I'm not 100% certain about that um, it could be a spelling, it could be a particular date, does it tie up with some other dates that I've mentioned in the past or character's age or something just needs me to just double check. Then I just run a highlighter 
over it and then come back to it at the end so that I can keep writing, keep having the, the writing flow. Um, so I'm doing the yellow edit today and I'm also making a few other changes and just kind of uh, adding things here and there and I've put in the historical information at the very end and uh, just trying to tidy it up and start to prepare for the first full edit um, which I will do tomorrow. So I will start at the very beginning and work my way through to, to the very end and on the first edit I do stop and start so if I see that there's a word missing or a misspelling or a character's name that I've forgotten to change um, or any problems that I think it doesn't make sense or it's underwritten or overwritten uh, I will change it. Um, the idea is that I'll then do it again, I'll go back to the very beginning and start going all the way through. Um, and I'll do that several times until eventually I'm reading it through and I'm not finding anything wrong. That's not to say with 134,000 words that there's nothing wrong, um, just that uh, I can't see it, the wood for the trees anymore. So then it gets passed to somebody else and they go through it and then it comes back to me and so on and so forth and then a proofreader has it. So there's still quite a way to go until, uh, until it's actually out. Uh, it's really good to have it finished in this in this draft format so um, yeah very exciting and probably after a couple of edits I will then be able to tell Pat Dengate the cover designer the exact length so that he can make the cover fit around the, the paperback and then I can start doing things like um, putting it up onto Amazon getting the image up and write the blurb and all that kind of thing so, still a way to go, but uh, the end is nigh. Hi. So, really quick update. Um, yesterday I finished the second structural edit of the Sterling Affair, which is very exciting. Uh, so basically what that is, is I go through the story from beginning to end, uh, making changes um, that are to do with the structure of it. So making sure things make sense, having finished the book, um, particularly with this one, which is quite complicated in that it's told back to front. Um, making sure things that I wrote at the beginning still make sense um, based on what I've written at the end. Uh, and checking that characterization holds through and people are doing things that make sense to them based on the, the whole piece. Um, sometimes, what I often find is that I underwrite actually. Lots of authors I think they find by the end they've written too much and they have to cut words. Um, I seem to underwrite, don't know why. Uh, so actually the word count is, has gone up and it's around 137,000 words, which is the longest uh, story I've uh, written. In fact, it's almost 138. I wouldn't be surprised if it ended up there by the end. Um, and yeah, I'm really pleased with it. I'm very happy to uh, uh, with the whole storyline and how it's all how it all unfolds and Morton's part and uh, everything so um, basically I now have a few days of rest and to catch up on emails etc uh, while the first proofreader reads it uh, again it's mainly for structural uh, points at this stage so just making sure does the storyline actually make sense um, do the dates all match up and ages and you know and obviously picking up on small points like commas in the wrong place or uh, words missing. I don't know why, but I can read something six times and not see that there's a, a crucial word missing from a sentence. I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's good. So I've got a few days off and then um, it will come back to me and I will then go through it again from beginning to end. And the idea is with the next edit, it's a bit faster read and I shouldn't be stopping to, to pick up on errors anymore that's the that's the hope anyway um so yes very good uh, place to be um so i'll keep you posted so very exciting uh, the sterling affair is back from the first structural uh, reader and with lots of good feedback which is fantastic and uh, made a few adjustments to it and this morning sent it off to the early readers which is about 12 people who will go through it looking for any problems, any typos, missing words, uh, anything that doesn't make sense to them. And then uh, back to me to read again with uh, any changes I need to make based on their feedback. 
So it's all very exciting. And I've just sent the blurb to the cover designer. So I should get the paperback layout uh, within a day or two, hopefully. Um, so it's all good, it's all moving ahead. It's very exciting. So it's the 11th of January. Um, I've had all my early readers feedback um, back and have made the changes and suggestions uh, and found, corrected the typos that they found. Um, it's been through several proofreaders and editors. And at last, uh, I'm now um, doing the final, final paperback check, which is basically submitting everything and KDP, um, an Amazon company that I publish through, uh, they kind of format everything for me, but I just need to check it all. So I'm just checking that everything's centered, I can read everything, there's no uh, overlap on the edge that might uh, bleed out when it's printed. Uh, and then I literally check each page and make sure I'm happy that there's no um, formatting errors mainly here. I don't actually reread the text at this point. I'm just simply uh, checking that, for example, that page one starts there and it's a right hand uh, page. And then I'm literally going through and just checking that it looks okay formatting wise rather than content wise at this point. And when I get to page uh, 392, if I'm happy with everything, I click approve and uh, and then I can order a proof copy. And then I'll check that, a physical proof copy, and see how that looks. So I will um, let you know rather than subject you to watching me check every single page. So, very exciting day to day. Um, dun dun dun! Amazon have just delivered the proof copy of Sterling Affair, which may be uh, great and be ready to go therefore, it may need adjustments. So for the first time ever, here it is. Amazing. So it looks good on the front and the side. I need to check each and every page now and make sure it's okay. Um, the back looks like I need to make an adjustment because the text is too close to the edge. So that's a shame. Uh, I can't today click go on it and there may be other issues inside that need to change. But that's kind of what happens. That's what the proofing stage is about rather than clicking and go and then people are ordering it and buying it and uh, the text is incorrect. So I will now go through it uh, page at a time checking formatting, making sure there's no blank pages or uh, there's any problems. Then I will have to now order another proof copy and uh, that will be another two or three days until that arrives and then um, hopefully that will be okay and I can click go on it. Okay, so take two, uh, it's just arrived. Um, so what I did was I changed uh, the last book because they had problems on the back with uh, the description and the blurb was bleeding too close to the edge. So I made the changes, resubmitted it and have ordered it. I can't open it, bear with me. <laughs> Here we go. Right, let's hope this is okay. Okay, it looks okay from the outside now. So I also um, pulled the words in slightly there because I was just fractionally a bit too close to the spine and uh, towards the edge here. So that looks good to me. It's all centered and it works. That's good. And uh, the back is perfect, I think. Um, you can see it's much, much better, much uh, further away from the edge now and um, looks fine, totally fine, totally happy with the spine. So I could be on the verge of clicking uh, go on uh, publish it in Kindle form and paperback. I'm just gonna have one final uh, check through of each page just to make sure nothing's gone adrift. It shouldn't have done because I haven't actually changed the, the content of the book. So um, yes, I might well be uh, clicking go today, which is very exciting. So stay tuned. Okay, so um, the book was totally fine. I'm very happy with it. There's no problems uh, that I can see. So I'm going to, so I go into um, KDP, Direct Publishing, 
and this is a uh, file for the Sterling Affair and uh, go down to paperback and I'm going to click publish your paperback book now. Dun, dun, dun. Save successful. So there we go. The Sterling Affair has been submitted uh, and it will be up to 72 hours and it will be available to purchase as a paperback. So uh, then I go back to the main page uh, and so you can see the paperback actions is now ghosted out. That's just going through, it's in review. So um, just got to wait now for that. So I can go to uh, the ebook, so the Kindle version. And da, da, da. I've already filled in all the details. So uh, my name and this is uh, the blurb, um, contact details, etc. And there's keywords that I, I put in. Uh, various categories, so if people are searching for historical or crime books, uh, it will come up. Um, I'm ready to release my book now, so save and continue. Done. And then it takes me to the next page, which is the content. So the manuscript is, has been uploaded, the cover has been uploaded, I have already checked it and um, everything's Fine, so I will click save and continue. Preparing your files. If this does take a few minutes, I will stop recording so that you don't have to watch an endless uh, circle spinning around. And basically there's one more step, which is uh, the pricing and then literally clicking go. So I'll pause it uh, for a moment and come back in a second. So uh, The Sterling Affair is now out in paperback and Kindle and it's uh, selling very well. It's already been uh, within one day, it was in uh, number one in the Australian historical mystery Kindle chart and creeping up into the top three in Canada um, and doing very well uh, generally around the other marketplaces. Um, early feedback and reviews have been very good and everyone seems to think, uh, or lots of people think it's possibly the best one yet, which is lovely to hear. Um, so this will probably be the last video I do for this, uh, showing how the Sterling Affair has uh, come to be, from the initial ideas and research to the writing through to publication. So I hope you found it helpful. Um, and yeah, thank you for reading and for supporting. Um, and uh, enjoy the books. Thank you very much.